Super Heavy Booster 11 has just aced its static fire test, meanwhile, Starship 29 is undergoing significant design upgrades at the build site for a launch attempt next month. The Starship Human Landing System interior design has been unveiled. Additionally, at Kennedy Space Center, SpaceX has demolished its orbital launch mount legs. Join us as we uncover these latest developments. After completing its static fire test campaign with two back-to-back -back tests, Starship 29 returned to the production site on Thursday, March 28. The ship then moved inside the high bay for pre-launch preparations. Surprisingly, on April 1, teams began removing thermal protection system tiles from Ship 29's nose cone region. The tiles on the tip of the nose cone, which have a pattern different from the rest, were the ones removed. Subsequently, scratches were made on the tip, likely to enhance glue adherence. Teams then began carefully reinstalling the heat tiles, aligning them one by one. Several heat tiles fell from Starship 28 during the third integrated flight test in March. Most of them were lost during the atmospheric re-entry phase at the end of Ship 28's flight. Elon Musk previously stated that the goal of Flight 4 is to get through maximum re-entry heating, with all systems functioning. The nose cone areas bear the brunt of the intense heat generated by compression and friction as the Starship hurtles through the Earth's atmosphere at high speed. So, for the success of Flight 4, it's crucial to ensure the heat tiles over the nose cone stay intact during flight. Ship 29 came out of the high bay on April 4, revealing that more tiles have been removed from various locations on its windward side. Tiles were removed in bulk from the aft end of the ship. This action may have been influenced by insights gleaned from Flight 3 data. These locations now require new tiles with much better adhesives. Let's hope that the tile upgrade ensures they remain attached to the vehicle throughout all phases of Flight 4. Much of the work to repair the damage the orbital launch mount sustained during IFT-3 has been completed in the past week. Specifically, two hoses delivering liquid methane and oxygen to the Super Heavy booster were replaced with new ones. These two lines were heavily damaged during Flight 3, and hopefully, they will survive Flight 4. Following all necessary fixes, a purge test of the entire Stage 0 was conducted on April 2 to ensure the proper functioning of pumps, heat exchangers, pipes, valves, and other components responsible for delivering propellants to the booster. Booster quick disconnect purge tests were also carried out to verify functionality. Additionally, all the remaining work on the rocket catching and stacking arms was also completed in the past week. SpaceX rerouted much of the wiring and added conduit shielding to protect it from the booster's exhaust during liftoff. These adjustments were necessary because the exhaust from the last launch caused significant damage to a sizable portion of the wiring. When the launch pad got completely ready to host rocket testing, teams began the preparations for Booster 11 static fire tests. Super Heavy Booster 11, which has been resting inside the Mega Bay since November, was rolled out to the launch site on Wednesday, April 3. Upon arrival, the booster was moved towards the launch pad, positioned between the tower arms, and subsequently lifted and placed atop the launch mount. Preparations for the Booster 11's static fire test began on Friday morning. Propellant loading into the vehicle began at 3.45 p.m., and within 40 minutes, the booster was fueled to the required level. The Raptor engine chill-down process commenced next to precondition the engines to the right temperature for ignition. The water deluge system was activated next, followed by the ignition of all 33 Raptors of the booster for roughly 10 seconds. This may have been a full duration test, we will have to wait for confirmation from SpaceX. Static fire tests are carried out to make sure the plumbing, valves, ignition systems, and engines of the booster are operating as intended, before an actual launch. Booster 11 will return to the build site next week for final preparations ahead of the wet dress rehearsal. The team will conduct a thorough inspection of the vehicle's plumbing and electrical systems and install the hot stage ring in the coming days. Once both Booster 11 and Ship 29 are ready for the wet dress rehearsal, they will return to the launch site for their final pre-launch test. A successful wet dress rehearsal will set the stage for the fourth integrated flight test. As per CEO Elon Musk, SpaceX is now targeting May for IFT-4. However, the investigation into the Flight 3 mishap is still ongoing, and SpaceX will only receive the Flight 4 launch license once the investigation is complete and all required corrective actions are implemented. Given that Flight 3 was nearly successful, we can hope that the investigation will not uncover any major issues that could significantly delay the next launch. Destin, from the Smarter Everyday YouTube channel, recently had the opportunity to visit NASA's Neutral Buoyancy Lab, located in Houston, Texas. His video showcased the Starship Human Landing System mock-up set up inside the NBL pool for astronaut training. What you are seeing here is the Starship Lunar Lander hull, an airlock for the astronauts, and an elevator mock-up. 
In this video, astronauts can be seen training both inside and outside the lander mock-up. Two astronauts, wearing lunar EVA suits, exited the airlock and moved into the elevator with their tool kits. The elevator then opened, allowing the astronauts to exit the lander and walk over the simulated lunar environment on the pool floor. The training received at the Neutral Buoyancy Lab will prepare astronauts for lunar excavation during future Artemis missions. The Starship Lander replica aids in familiarizing them with the vehicle's hardware and operations. From the mock-up, it can be inferred that the pressurized airlock of the lander opens to the unpressurized hull that will store cargo and other items. Astronauts will have to walk through the hull to access the elevator that takes them to the lunar surface. There could be an elevator from the upper pressurized crew cabin to the airlock for astronaut transfer. You can watch the complete Smarter Everyday video from the link provided in the description. Starships and super heavies that will be launched on subsequent flights after Flight 4 are currently in various stages of development at the build site. Starship 30 relocated from the high bay into the mega bay last Thursday afternoon. Subsequently, Ship 29 was moved back into the high bay. Inside the mega bay, Ship 30 was positioned atop an engine installation stand in preparation for Raptor installation. The static fire testing for Ship 30 is anticipated to occur after Flight 4. Teams continue to work diligently on the construction of the new Starship static fire test stand and a massive flame trench at Massey's test site, located several kilometers from the starbase. The excavation work is nearing completion. The third and final piece of the Starship static fire test stand flame deflector arrived at Massey's last Wednesday. The newly delivered piece will be assembled with the two pieces already at Massey's in the coming days to complete the flame deflector. The flame deflector will be placed inside the flame drench, over which the static fire test stand will be built. The exhaust from the six Raptor engines of the ship will be safely directed away by this flame trench. Water will be sprayed through the thousands of holes that will be drilled on the deflector's water channels to create a protective layer over the deflector, shielding it from the intense heat of the Raptor exhaust plume. Once operational, the new test stand at Massey's will enable SpaceX to conduct significantly more powerful and prolonged static fire tests compared to those currently performed at the launch site. SpaceX has recently completed the demolition of all the six Starship orbital launch mount legs erected at Kennedy Space Center's Pad 39A. It's currently unclear why SpaceX demolished these six legs, which were completed in 2022. It's possible that SpaceX decided to reinforce the launch pad's foundation before the installation of the water deluge system. Removing the legs could facilitate modifications to the pad and streamline the construction of the deluge system. Alternatively, SpaceX might be redesigning the launch mount legs to enhance their overall strength. If that's the case, the upgraded design may also be implemented at the second launch pad that will be built at Starbase in the near future. Only time will reveal the true motive behind this development. Stay tuned to this channel for further updates in the coming weeks. Now, let's discuss some of the latest updates from the world of science and technology. NASA has recently made significant strides in advancing moon mobility for the Artemis missions by selecting three commercial teams to develop lunar terrain vehicles, or LTVs. The agency announced on April 3 that it had picked teams led by Intuitive Machines, Lunar Outpost, and Venturi Astrolab for its Lunar Terrain Vehicle Services contract. Intuitive Machines is leading a team called Moon Racer, or Reusable Autonomous Crewed Exploration Rover. The lander would be delivered on a Nova D lander that Intuitive Machines is building, a larger version of the Nova C Odysseus lander that landed on the moon in February. Lunar Outpost, a startup currently working on small robotic rovers, is leading a team called Lunar Dawn. And Venturi Astrolab is offering its Flex rover, a robotic version of which it plans to send to the moon aboard a SpaceX Starship mission in late 2026. The LTV contract will be worth up to $4.6 billion over the next 15 years, including five years of development and a decade of operations on the moon. The LTVs will feature state-of-the-art technology, autonomous control systems, long-lasting tires to navigate the challenging lunar terrain, and advanced navigation systems to withstand the extreme conditions at the moon's south pole. The LTVs are expected to travel at speeds up to 15 km per hour, cover distances of up to 20 km on a single charge, and support astronauts for 8 hours. These capabilities will significantly enhance astronauts' ability to explore the lunar south pole, conduct scientific research, and traverse greater distances than previously possible. The three winning companies did not offer many technical details about their rovers, in part because they still have work to do refining their designs. The companies will spend the next 12 months refining their designs before NASA chooses a single contractor to proceed with the actual development of the rover. NASA plans to use LTV for the Artemis 5 mission and beyond.
The rovers will play a crucial role in advancing scientific discovery, technology evolution, and preparing for future crewed missions to Mars. You might remember the Japanese slim lander that managed to land upside down on the lunar surface back in January. As per the latest reports, despite the solar panels pointing away from the sun, the lander has survived the long cold lunar night for the second time. SLIM, short for Smart Lander for Investigating Moon, successfully touched down inside the Shioli crater near the lunar equator on January 19, making Japan the fifth country to soft land a spacecraft on the moon. Nevertheless, an anomaly occurred during the descent phase, resulting in terminal damage to one of the two primary engines, leading to uneven thrust. Consequently, SLIM landed in a nose-down position, orienting its solar panels westward, impeding sufficient sunlight from reaching its systems. Despite this setback, SLIM carried out scientific missions during the approximately 14 Earth day long lunar daytime. However, the spacecraft's operations on the surface have been limited due to its incorrect orientation. After that, SLIM was put into a deep sleep mode for the impending harsh lunar night. JAXA said at the time that SLIM was not designed to survive the deep cold of roughly 14 Earth day lunar nighttime, as temperatures will fall below minus 130 Celsius, damaging the spacecraft electronics. But surprisingly, on February 25th, when JAXA sent wake-up calls to SLIM, the spacecraft responded, confirming its successful survival through the lunar night while maintaining communication capabilities. After two weeks of limited operations, SLIM again went to sleep mode in mid-March ahead of its second lunar night. On March 28, the official SLIM account on X reported receiving a response from the lander the previous night, confirming that it had successfully survived its second lunar night. Mission Control at JAXA managed to capture images with the lander's navigational camera and collect data for a short period of time. As per the acquired data, some temperature sensors and unused battery cells are starting to malfunction, but most functions that endured the first lunar night remained intact even after the second lunar night. The SLIM team remains optimistic that, having survived the second lunar night, the spacecraft will be able to continue its scientific operations in the coming days. SLIM's touchdown in January was swiftly followed by Intuitive Machines' Odysseus lander a month later. Odysseus became the first commercial vehicle ever to ace a moon landing when it touched down near the rim of the Malapurde crater, approximately 300 kilometers from the lunar south pole, on February 22. However, that landing turned out to be dramatic. Odysseus descended a bit faster than anticipated due to issues with its laser rangefinders, resulting in the breakage of one or more of its six landing legs upon touchdown. Consequently, the spacecraft toppled onto its side. Despite the rough landing, the spacecraft operated on the lunar surface for the next seven days, and NASA got data back from all five of its active scientific instruments. On February 29, as the sun descended toward the horizon, the lander entered the lengthy lunar night, with hopes pinned on its revival upon receiving sufficient sunlight after the night's end. Intuitive machines attempted to re-establish communication with Odysseus on March 20, but failed to detect a wake-up signal. Three days later, the company announced the lander had permanently faded after cementing its legacy into history as the first commercial lunar lander to land on the moon. Please check out my previous videos to learn about the SLIM and Odysseus landers. Links are in the description. Thank you for tuning in for the latest science news and Starship updates. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, leave a comment, and share it with your friends. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you never miss an episode.